world news tonight. Travelling tornado. Elsa continues to wreak havoc as it moves north with stronger gusts. Back on track. Ever Given set sail successfully after over a hundred days spent in Suez Canal. Spectator woes. Tokyo 2021 may no longer be open for the public as infection fields run amok. Chanel Charm. Dazzling displays of haute couture take to the stage in Paris under the open sky. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the United States. For days, Floridians were bracing for Storm Elsa. The tropical storm moves north after landfall on Florida's west coast, bringing driving rains, whipping winds and some road floodings and leaving many without power. Elsa is charging north after intensifying to a Category 1 hurricane and hammering Florida's west coast. Heavy rain and wind gusts up to 75 miles an hour. I wouldn't, wouldn't want to live through a bigger hurricane, that's for sure. It was downgraded to a tropical storm earlier today after making landfall for the third time. Tonight, a likely tornado in Jacksonville, leaving at least one person dead and a trail of destruction. In Gainesville, emergency crews are evacuating people from their homes, and flash flooding remains a major threat for states in Elsa's path. The Coast Guard rescued 15 people and is searching for nine others, missing after a boat capsized off the coast of Key West. Utility crews now trying to restore power to 26,000 customers in the state. But across the eastern seaboard, millions are still bracing for wind, rain, and the threat of tornadoes through the end of the week. Still in the U.S., a difficult day in the surf side as mission shifts from rescue to recovery from the condominium tower collapse, along with Florida reporting on the highest single-day death toll. A moment of silence in Surfside, Florida on Wednesday as officials called off the search for survivors after a building collapsed there two weeks ago. They say there's no longer any hope of pulling someone alive from the ruins. Miami-Dade County Mayor Danielle Levine Cava said operations will turn to recovery as of Thursday. It is with deep, profound sadness that this afternoon I'm able to share that we made the extremely difficult decision to transition from operation search and rescue to recovery. At this point, we have truly exhausted every option available to us in the search and rescue mission. No one had been found alive since the first few hours after part of the 12-story Champlain Tower South Condo caved in, while no signs of life had been detected by equipment or trained dogs since then. Round-the-clock crews have since extracted the remains of 54 people from the rubble. However, 86 people are still missing of those believed to have been inside the condo when it fell. Officials say there is some possibility that they may be found elsewhere or have been double counted. The assistant chief of Miami-Dade Fire Rescue, Ray Jadala, hinted that few bodies were being found intact and instead called the recovery's human remains. Investigators have still not determined what caused the building to fall apart without warning, though an engineering report from 2018 warned of structural deficiencies in the tower. Haiti's interim prime minister urged residents of the Caribbean nation to stay calm after guns shot the president dead in his home. Haiti declared a state of emergency on Wednesday, hours after the brazen assassination of the Caribbean nation's president. The government said President Chavnel Moïse was shot dead by unidentified attackers in his home in Port-au-Prince overnight in what it called a barbaric act. The 53-year-old president's wife, Martine Moïse, was also shot and injured and receiving medical treatment. Interim Prime Minister Claude Joseph said in televised remarks that the government had declared a state of emergency amid confusion over who would take over the reins of the country. In Washington, U.S. President Joe Biden was briefed on the murder and called the situation in Haiti worrisome. What's your reaction, Mr. President, to the ha Haitian president being assassinated? We need a lot more information, but it's, it's just it's very worrisome. The assassination coincides with a wave of gang violence as armed groups battle police and one another for control of the streets in recent months. Haiti is the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. It faces a growing humanitarian crisis and food shortage, and fears of widespread chaos are spreading. 
The Dominican Republic announced it was closing its border with Haiti. The U.S. Embassy said in a statement it would be closed Wednesday due to the ongoing security situation. Moise faced fierce protests after taking office as president in 2017. This year, the opposition accused him of seeking to install a dictatorship, which he denied. A huge container ship, MV Ever Given, which blocked the Suez Canal for six days in March, finally steamed out of the waterway after Egypt and the vessel's Japanese owners signed a compensation deal. Jets of water arc into the air from tugboats in the Suez Canal in celebration as the Ever Given finally continues her voyage. One of the world's largest cargo vessels, she'd been held since blocking the Maritime Passage in March in a dispute with Egyptian authorities over compensation. The Ever Given plowed into one wall of the canal amid a sandstorm and lodged against the other, blocking the passage that sees some $9 billion in goods transit daily. Frantic efforts to free the ship ensued as traffic backed up in the hundreds, losing Egypt between 10 and $15 million in revenue each day. The Ever Given finally floated free six days later, though that was just the beginning. The Suez Canal Authority initially demanded nearly a billion dollars in compensation before dropping the number to 550 million. Ultimately, both sides came to an undisclosed settlement three months on, though the SCA said it also received a new tugboat as part of the deal. As the Ever Given continues north, escorted by tugs, New plans are afoot to widen and deepen the southern part of the canal over the next two years, where the Ever Given ran aground. The highest court in Belarus convicted an aspiring rival to the nation's authoritarian president on corruption charges that rejects as politically motivated and sentenced him to 14 years in prison. One of Belarus's leading opposition figures sentenced to 14 years in prison. Viktor Babariko is the latest political opponent of longtime President Alexander Lukashenko to be jailed or forced into exile. His lawyer says he will fight the charges inside Belarus and at the United Nations. Babariko was arrested in June 2020, accused of taking bribes and of money laundering while head of a bank. This was just two months before a presidential election in which Favorico was seen as a front-runner. Several other opposition figures were also arrested before the vote. In August, Lukashenko claimed a landslide victory and a sixth term as president, sparking the biggest protests in Belarus's modern history. The opposition claimed the vote was rigged. Western powers using sanctions targeting the government and companies to call for an end to authoritarian measures. Authorities in Belarus have not been subdued by foreign pressure, continuing to clamp down on dissent, most brazenly grounding a Ryanair passenger flight in late May to detain an opposition journalist on board. The UN also says more than 35,000 people have been detained there this year for protesting, and some have been tortured. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. The UN said that Iran has begun the process of producing enriched uranium metal, a move that could help it develop a nuclear weapon, and that three European powers and the threatened talks to revive the 2015 Iranian nuclear deal. A cross-Atlantic condemnation after Iran took yet another step to enrich uranium, which at high concentrations could make a nuclear weapon. That's according to the UN atomic watchdog, the IAEA. It is worrying that Iran is choosing uh, to continue to escalate its non-performance of its JCPOA commitments, um, especially with experiments that um, have value for uh, nuclear weapons research. Uh, it's another unfortunate step backwards for Iran. With this statement, Washington joined a chorus of European voices calling on Tehran to halt its brinkmanship. This as negotiations continue in the Austrian capital to clinch a deal under which both sides return to their commitments. The original accord, also known as the JCPOA, was abandoned by former President Donald Trump. Now one country that has serious reservations about a diplomatic path with Iran is regional arch foe Israel. In fact, the Islamic Republic repeatedly pointed the finger at Tel Aviv for sabotage incidents at its key nuclear sites. 
While Israel has never officially taken responsibility for attacks on Iranian soil, the country's officials and media outlets have consistently hinted at it. Afghan government officials and Taliban representatives have met in Tehran for peace talks amid the pullout of U.S. troops from Afghanistan. The talks are the first significant discussions in months between the two sides from the war-battered country. High-level peace talks have been held between an Afghan government delegation and militant Taliban group representatives in Tehran. According to Iranian state-run media IRNA, the two sides met on Wednesday for their first significant talk since discussions in Qatar some months ago. The talks come amid the nearing completion of the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan and with an increasing number of districts across the country falling to the Taliban. Afghan government officials, including former Vice President Yunus Kanuni and others from Kabul's High Council for National Reconciliation, were in Iran's capital to meet with Sher Mohammad Abbas Staniksai, who headed the Taliban political committee. The outcome of the meeting wasn't reported, but according to state run media, the Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Jarif chaired the meeting. He said while greeting the two sides that Iran is ready to assist the dialogue to resolve conflicts in Afghanistan, mentioning the failure of the U.S. in Afghanistan. He also urged them to take difficult decisions for the future of their country. The talks come after the U.S. announced on Tuesday that 90 percent of its troops had left the country after a 20-year-long military campaign with the drawdown to be finished by late August. According to Afghan local media, the Taliban have increased territorial control since the pullout of U.S. troops, dominating more than 100 districts out of 400. The Australian city of Sydney has recorded its highest daily rise in COVID cases in months, despite being an in lockdown for nearly two weeks. To give us more details on this, we have other than a World News Special Correspondent, Timothy Phillip, joining us now from Melbourne in Australia. Timothy? Yes, Shannon. The New South Wales state government reported 38 cases in its capital today, pushing the case number of this Delta outbreak over 370. Authorities said people were breaching lockdown rules by going to other households. They have pleaded with residents to abide by the stay-at-home order. The mobility restrictions come amid mounting concerns about sluggish and dysfunctional vaccination rollout in Australia which currently has one of the lowest COVID-19 inoculation rates in the developed world at just 8% of the adult population. Travel agents say they are frustrated with the on-again, off-again nature of lockdowns across the nation. Current lockdown measures in Sydney are set to remain in place until July 16, as the country's biggest city grapples with an outbreak of the highly infectious Delta variant. Tourists are not allowed to enter the country and Australians are not allowed to leave unless they have compelling reasons and evidence to back it up. Treasury estimates assume a reopening in mid-2022. Although Morrison, with an eye on an election sometime in the year ahead, has refused to commit to a timeline. Back to you, Chanel. Thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. Japan's Prime Minister Yoshihira Suga has declared a coronavirus state of emergency for Tokyo that will run through the city's hosting of the Olympics, as organizers considering banning all spectators from the event. Olympic organizers are poised to ban all spectators from the Games. That's according to Japan's Asahi newspaper on Thursday. Organisers were set to formally reach the decision on spectators during five-way talks between key parties to be held later in the evening. The International Olympic Committee's head, Thomas Bach, arrived in Tokyo earlier in the day and was set to chair that meeting. It's the latest blow to the troubled Summer Games, already delayed by a year because of the pandemic and plagued by a series of setbacks, including massive budget blowouts. Japan is also preparing to declare a state of emergency for Tokyo that will coincide with its hosting of the event. Medical experts have said for weeks that having no spectators at the Games would be the least risky option. 
there's been widespread public concern that the influx of thousands of athletes and officials will fuel a fresh wave of infections. Organisers have already banned overseas spectators and have for now set a cap on domestic viewers at 50% capacity, up to 10,000 people. Anyone wanting to support athletes has been told to do so by clapping rather than cheering or singing. We have some good news for you. Around 600,000 tonnes of plastic end up in the Mediterranean Sea yearly. A French company has introduced the robotic sea cleaning bot that gobbled up plastic bags, discarded bottles and even used surgical masks floating on the water. At the port of the French city, the remote-controlled electric-powered boat weaves around the harbour, sucking the trash into a net that is trails behind its hulls. The jellyfish bot is about the size of a suitcase and can pick up rubbish from the corners and narrow spaces where trash tend to accumulate but which are too inaccessible for cleaners with nets to reach. The jellyfish is not the only device of its kind. San Diego non-profit Clear Blue Sea is developing a prototype trash collecting drone called FRED. The jellyfish bot is in operation at around 15 French ports and has been exported to countries including Singapore, Japan and Norway. The firm has just launched an autonomous version. Port director Pascal said the robot lightens the workload of the local cleaners. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Former U.S. President Donald Trump filed lawsuits against Twitter, Facebook and Alphabet Google as well as their chief executives alleging their unlawful silence conservative viewpoints. South African President Jacob Zuma turned himself into police to begin 15 months in jail for contempt of court, the culmination of a long legal drama seen as tests of the post-apartheid state's ability to enforce the rule of law. The South of Korea is grappling with torrential monsoon rain for a fourth straight day. To date, two people have died and several hundred others forced to evacuate their homes. As the world continues its fight against the pandemic, the WHO says that there have now been more than 4 million COVID-19 related deaths across the globe. Pope Francis, who's recovering from surgery, is said to be reviewing a visit to North Korea. His recovery reportedly allowed him to continue planning his journey aimed to spreading encouragement around the world. The Gates Foundation said Melinda and Bill Gates in the midst of a high-profile divorce will continue to work as co-chairs for a two-year trial period and that she would step down after that time. Their high-profile marriage is coming to an end and so too could their groundbreaking partnership in global philanthropy. The Gates Foundation on Wednesday announced that Bill and Melinda Gates would continue to work as co-chairs for two years but that she would step down after that time if their arrangement doesn't work. It's a contingency plan aimed at ensuring a smooth transition for the foundation, which has spent over $50 billion in the past two decades toward combating poverty and disease. It would also ensure Melinda received personal resources from Bill for her own philanthropic work, which would be completely separate from the foundation's endowment, the organization said in a blog post. Bill would then assume full stewardship of the Gates Foundation, which the couple had often referred to as their fourth child. Founded in 2000, the Gates Foundation has become one of the most powerful and influential forces in global public health. Last year, it committed over $1.7 billion to combat the health crisis. Wednesday's announcement also comes after billionaire investor Warren Buffett in June said he was resigning as a trustee of the Gates Foundation and had donated half his wealth to philanthropy since pledging 15 years ago to give away his fortune from running Berkshire Hathaway. Bill and Melinda Gates filed for divorce in May after 27 years of marriage but had pledged to continue their philanthropic work together. To that end, the two on Wednesday committed another $15 billion to the Gates Foundation, their single largest contribution since 2000. And finally tonight, French couture house Christian Dior kicked off Paris Fashion Week with in-person runaway show drawing celebrities to the front row in an attempt to revive a touch of the pre-pandemic glamour. 
The fall or winter 2021-2022 collection was unveiled in Paris this afternoon to a smattering of mask-wearing guests and live-streamed globally in a film made in a partnership. Chanel's impressionist-inspired haute couture show in Paris was filled with splashes of colour, feathers and sequins held in front of a live audience as restrictions ease. In past months, fashion brands have showcased their collections in online forms only, such as short films. With vaccinations progressing and lockdowns loosening, fashion is tiptoeing its way back to traditional catwalk shows for now mixing live audiences and online presentations. Well, that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.